Hello and welcome. We're coming live from Singapore. We are at Innovate for Climate, and this is the Digital Media Zone. Um, this week, leaders from finance, carbon markets, and technology are gathering here to discuss uh, solutions to climate change. Please follow the, hum the conversation with the hashtag Innovate for Climate. Uh, I'm Isabel Saldarriaga. I'm Communications Officer at the World Bank, and I'm here with Celine Ranstein. Um, climate change specialist at the World Bank. So this morning at 8.30, um, Celine launched the report, State and Trends of Carbon Pricing. This is a series, and uh, we want to understand sort of like the findings and also a little bit of what, what the report, what's the importance of the report. Hi, Isabel, and thanks for having me. So yeah, this morning we presented this report, which we publish every year, and what this report does, it looks at the state and the trends of carbon pricing instruments around the world. So what this means is we look at which countries, which cities, which regions, which provinces put a price on carbon, either through instruments like carbon tax or through a carbon market. And we report on that, we try to tell you what are the progress, what are the drawbacks, what are the difficulties, and what are the trends. Great, thank you. So um, what are the key overall findings uh, of the state and trends of carbon pricing? So, the, the key findings for this year, and let me just say that uh, our audience can find all of these findings online, not only in the report, but also on a dashboard where they can even play and download all of the right. data. It's accessible and free for all. So the key findings of this year report is first that there is still momentum for carbon pricing. It's moving forward and countries do see carbon pricing as a key instrument uh, to, for their climate mitigation action. We see 57 initiatives implemented around the world, so either carbon taxes or carbon markets. And the main development in the past years were in the Americas, in Canada, uh, at the province level mostly, in the US, in some state as well, uh, a new carbon tax in Argentina. For the first time, the first ever uh, carbon pricing instrument implemented in South Africa. Uh, that's the first instrument implemented for Africa. And uh, right here in Asia, uh, in Singapore actually, a carbon tax was implemented earlier this year. And we still see ongoing development, pilots, voluntary markets developed in Thailand, Vietnam. Uh, China is still making efforts for its uh, domestic uh, carbon market. And we see some other uh, jurisdiction continuing to consider carbon pricing to develop new instruments. We also see all of these jurisdictions that we already reported on in the past year making improvement to their instruments, either by increasing the level of the tax or by making reforms to their in, uh, existing carbon markets mechanism. In terms of the coverage, though, we didn't increase, it didn't increase that much. We were still at 20% of the global emission covered by some type of instrument. We, we saw a big jump with the announcement of the Chinese domestic uh, carbon market, but since then, all of the announcements add up to a pretty small increase. So it's still only 20% of global emission only that are priced uh, with some type of carbon pricing instrument. And in terms of the price level, here as well, we're making some progress and some prices are increasing, but overall, the level of prices are really too low. We have 51% of the emission covered by carbon pricing that are priced at less than $10 per ton of CO2 equivalent. And when uh, you might remember that a few years ago, we did a report uh, on, with a commission of economists with Joe Stiglitz and Nicola Stern on asking the question, how high the price of carbon needs to be to be aligned with the Paris Agreement. And the answer to that was, well, it needs to be at least 40 to $80 per ton of CO2. I mean, of course, it might depend, uh, depending on the countries, uh, but overall, uh, around 40 to 80 by 2020. And if we look at the price level today, we're really far from there. Only 5% of the covered emissions, so 5% of these 20% are covered within this range. So in short, some progress, but still way too low. And this is only on explicit um, carbon prices, so either a tax or an emissions trading system. Uh, but the report also covers implicit for the first time. Why, why are we doing this? Yeah, absolutely. So you, you explained the difference very well. We have this explicit instrument that year after year we've been reporting on. But when you look at the map, if you go on the dashboard, you will see most countries are actually not covered because as I just say, they just don't have this explicit carbon pricing instrument. But yet, they might have fossil fuel subsidies. 
they might have fuel taxes, which de facto send a price signal to the economy and to the investor or to the consumer. Either it sends you a price that it's costly to pollute and you don't want to use too much fuel because you're taxed and you know it's, it's costing you a lot of money, or you're incentivized to pollute if the government have fossil fuel subsidies in place. So this year, we started to recognize this um, and to discuss it in a bit more detail in the report, First, because it's major in terms of volume, that this represents a lot of money that we could tap into for the uh, transition toward low carbon or for other development objectives that our, the countries we work, or, uh, we work with might have. Also because it's important when you implement a carbon tax to think more broadly about all of your fiscal framework and not just to think carbon pricing in isolation as a separate instrument. So implicit carbon pricing helps you to do that. And lastly, because you can argue it's a bit different, of course, to do fossil fuel subsidies re uh, reforms, but it has some common elements in terms of the political economy analysis, in terms of the mechanism you can put into place to compensate the uh, industry or the household who suffer from the consequences of potential higher energy prices, and also in terms of how you communicate about it. Yeah. So we can learn a lot from the implicit carbon pricing, uh, and we hope to do much more of this in the coming years. It, it seems like um, there's still some challenges on, on carbon pricing, uh, but we need to. So I don't know if you, if you have maybe a final um, takeaway for our audience. Well, I mean, all this year, in all of these interviews and in the sessions at the conference, we heard really clearly that the science is there. We know we have to, ha to act on climate, and we know we have to do it now. We also know that carbon pricing instruments are a really efficient way to help countries to reach their climate target. And it's happening. We know how to do it. We have a lot of countries, jurisdictions, cities, etc., who have done it in the past year. We can learn from them. We can exchange experiences. Sometimes it went badly. Sometimes it went well. So let's learn from that. We also know from implicit carbon pricing that we can learn a lot from other policies as well. Yet, as we just discussed, it's not happening fast enough. So I guess my final message would just be to keep going, to learn from experience, and to go higher. And hopefully, next year report, we'll be able to report on some more good news, which, we, which is definitely what we're working towards. So. Yeah. Well, thank you. And so you can find the report World Bank slash climate. You can Google the dashboard, uh, carbon pricing dashboard. So you can download the data and run your own reports. And follow the conversations from Singapore using the hashtag InnovateForClimate. And thank you for joining us. Thank, thank you. you.